Hi guys, welcome back. We're here and it is Friday morning and we have Lori here, a stand-in for um, Karen, who's uh, out for a little bit. She should be back in about a couple weeks. So welcome, thanks for being Thank here. Thank you. So we have a, a lot of people just on the calls. Um, I just wanna you know, have a disclaimer. Anything that we say is not meant to diagnose you or cure you, it's just for information for you to do your own research. Uh, it's illegal to cure people in the state of Maryland and Virginia. So you can't do that. So if anyone becomes cured, don't mention our names. Or, <laughs> oh okay, we're not responsible. Um, but anyway, um, I have a lot to talk about, a lot of great stuff. You might want to stick around and hear the whole show. But we do need to go to Liz that's been patiently waiting. She's from Oregon. Are you there, Liz? Are you there, Liz? Hi, I'm here. Hi, yes, how are you? I am here. Great. I'm doing good. Awesome. Pretty excited. Oh my goodness, this never happens. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it is. So you had a question about, I think, uh, belly fat. Yeah, I'm. I'm kind of in a different circle, and when I read your feed, I'm like in the Facebook group. Uh -huh. um, everybody is obviously trying to lose weight, lose fat, and get healthy. But my circumstance is I've always been really, really lean and self-conscious of my lean limbs. And um, after menopause, you know, two pregnancies, and now I'm 57 years old, I have this mid-growth, right? Mm -hmm. And my husband had me on the, just the typical macro diet and going to the gym, and I wasn't budging. Mm -hmm. And then he plateaued after almost a year, and then he's like, I'm going to try this keto stuff. And he found you. So he asked me if I wanted to join him, and I did. So I lost 12 pounds, and I've lost my third and fourth tire because it was like kind of like whenever you have to sit down, you feel it kind of growing right up underneath the breast. Mm -hmm. Those rolls are gone, wow. but I have this stubborn thing down here by my hips. Yeah. Now, is it a, super, yeah. is it a superficial yeah. um, layer, or is it deep protruding out? It's if I stand up straight and just kind of suck it in, it kind of fades away with okay. the rest of my physique. But if I put on something with a little bit of a spandex or a belt, then it's kind of like the muffin top effect. Okay. And I, I, I don't know if I can get much leaner. I'm 5'7", I'm at, and I'm down to 127, 128. Okay. And uh, what, how long have you been on it's, this uh, keto for? Um, I'm in my... Three and a half, going on four months, maybe. Okay, well, good. So I'm going to put you in pause, and I'll just kind of give you uh, what I would recommend. So, so a lot of people are noticing that they they do keto, and their stomach shrinks, um, and sometimes it takes longer because they have a fatty liver and they didn't really know it, and the body has to deal with that first, and that takes some time. And you've seen some significant changes in your midsection, and now because there's like three or different three or four types of patterns here, you have a person has a, a higher roll of fat higher up in the abdomen, which is kind of like a fatty liver roll. So if you had that, then you probably had a fatty liver. And then you have the lower pooch, okay, which could be superficial, or it could be deeper in the, uh, around the organs that's pushing out. Then you have the love handles on the side. So I think probably the last thing that's gonna go is that lower pooch type bulge that a lot of people have and that takes, especially if you had this for a long time, that could take literally about six to eight months. Um, the key, if you want to speed it up, is to do, do a little bit stricter um, intermittent fasting. But let's say, for example, you really don't want to lose any more weight because your other parts of your body are thin, then you're just going to have to keep your calories a little bit higher. Keep your calories higher, keep your fat a little bit higher, but do that one meal a day. Um, and then add an exercise too. I think that over time, Liz is going to handle that stomach to the point where it's completely flat. I would also, one last thing, work out in your fasting time frame. That will just give you some, some edge on that and make sure you have enough sleep. All right. Thanks, Liz. Okay. Rick, hi, how are you? You're from Arizona. Are you there? I'm here, yes. Hey, Rick. I I'm Hi, I've been on keto for about five weeks. I've lost 20 pounds, dropped my blood pressure about uh, 35 points now from the high of 80 down to 40. Wow. And um, I'm using, um, yeah, I've had a lot of good success here very quickly. I'm on a, a one meal a day, 
So I'm fasting for about 23 to 22 hours a day. So I'm taking your cerificus and your yeast. I'm taking omega-3. I'm taking the greens powder mm -hmm. and the electrolyte and the trace minerals. And I'm also doing the apple cider vinegar, and um, I'm adding lemon to that, and then I'll have a green tea during the day. How should I spread all this stuff out, and am I taking too much at once? I think in the beginning, um, Rick, I think it's, it's totally fine. As you get going, there's some certain ones that I think you maybe can take as a maintenance, but right now I think it's fine. I, honestly, I would take, you can take these on an empty stomach. You can take them in the morning. Um, when you're on keto, and you're especially doing one meal a day, you're fasting for a good amount of time. Um, your uric acid will go up, but that's going to act as an antioxidant. Um, if there's any chance that you're susceptible to a stone, then you just need to keep your fluid higher as well on this program. And I'm talking about 2.5 liters of, of liquids a day just to kind of keep your kidneys from saturating things too much. Um, <clears throat> and then what you do, and you're taking enough minerals to um, handle that as well, and you're also using your pH, you're actually you're bringing your pH down with the electrolytes. But what, the reason I'm bringing that up is that um, you could take it on an empty stomach and you don't have to worry about it. Um, you could also add the, the vitamin D and the omega-3 fatty acids. Anything that deals with oils, take that at your, your first meal, which is I don't know what time you're doing that. Um, and then, so I think your volume thing is all right. Might be over here or something. Yeah. Um, so that's what I would do, Rick. And then um, it's like a, a lot of people going into this are deficient. So you're, you're beefing up, no pun intended, your nutrients. And that's one of the things, as, as you do, and this one, one of the things I'm going to talk about today is that when you do keto, your body requires certain nutrients at a higher level. And so this is why people have, uh, they, they may be magnified as far as deficiencies, and they might show up, get a little symptom here, a symptom there. So you're, you're, you're flooding your body with a lot of good nutrients. I think I would ride the wave, especially if it's working, you know, and then you can drop it down over time. Thanks, Rick, and I'm glad that you're doing very well. Um, Lori. What do we, what do we, what's going on in social media? Do we? Oh my gosh, we have s people from all over the place today. Yeah. We've got Carolyn from Peru, uh, Ricardo from Ecuador, Karen in Wisconsin, Miss Castellan in Luxembourg, Lona, wow. Denmark, Ashley in North Carolina, that's where I'm from, and um, Perth, Australia, Ness. Wow. That is awesome. Isn't that fun? Yeah, all over the world. Um, that's great. So um, do we have a question? Oh, yes. I, I didn't write if down. You, if I you, didn't write you down. You need to look question. for one? Yeah, give me one okay. second. Okay, so while you're looking for that, I want to talk about what's behind keto rash. Okay, keto rash. Um, <clears throat> now, how could it be like here you are, you, you, you're eating something healthy, you're cutting out your carbs, cutting out the junk, and then you end up with a rash? People have this idea that it's like toxins coming out. It's not toxins coming out. Uh, they might have an idea that maybe it's the toxins from the fat coming out. It's usually not that. There's one specific nutrient that's responsible for the, uh, the keto rash, and that is B2, riboflavin. And what happens is that B2 specifically is needed when you increase the fat in your diet because the more fat that you eat, you need the B2 for the metabolism of fat. So if you're going into the keto, a little bit deficient, you have this subclinical deficiency that's not a major one but a minor, everything is magnified. All of a sudden you end up with a vitamin B2 deficiency. And if you ever heard of the condition called pellagra, which is you have to be very, very seriously deficient uh, for that to show up, um, you know, you're not, you're not going to actually have that degree, but you're going to have maybe a version of it and you're going to have like skin issues. So that's really what it is. So when you take B2, take, um, um, take it in, it's called um, an activated form. And you can take more of it. Uh, you can take the nutritional yeast, but you might need to take a little bit more of that. And then what you're going to find is that uh, the rash is going to go away. So many skin conditions occur when you're, um, when you're deficient in the B vitamins. And, but it could, you know, it's not necessarily that you're not eating those vitamins. Your digestive system 
is uh, messed up and usually have like irritable bowel syndrome or so many antibiotics or let's say you have low stomach acid and you can't absorb that B2. There's other things too, but the mm -hmm. point is that you want to take more of that to drive it in, mm -hmm. um, maybe even double or triple and then watch what happens, the skin starts clearing up. But that's for the rash. How do you make sure you absorb it though? Did well, I you just take, at this point, I would just focus on taking more of it. Because okay. if you have a history of like scar tissue in your gut or a fatty liver and you know, mm -hmm. it's like it's, you're gonna have to do keto for long enough to heal those organs, but in the meantime, we need to drive it in there. You need to just eat more of it or okay. consume more of it. That's good to know. Good food for thought. It is. Right? It is. Uh, so, what do we have for a question here? Well, from YouTube, we have a question about chlorophyll benefits from Kat Graham. Wants okay. to know what the benefits of chlorophyll are. Well, chlorophyll um, is in all the green stuff. It's in um, like all the leafy greens. And um, chlorophyll has some interesting properties. Uh, it has very, very high levels of a certain type of antioxidant that helps to heal the internal skin and external skin of your body. So a lot of times people take chlorophyll to heal an ulcer, for example, mm -hmm. or to put it on a burn, or mm -hmm. some type of lesion in their bodies that are like something that's damaged. But it actually will kind of go in there and, and prevent oxidation or breakdown of tissue. So it's a very good skin healer on the inside and external. But like also that. at the heart of chlorophyll, you have magnesium, and magnesium is Probably most people are deficient in magnesium. Probably half the population is deficient. And magnesium is for to make sure that you don't uh, have a skip heartbeat, a regular heartbeat, blood pressure, stress, it's for sleeping, and uh, it's for energy. So you have like 300 different enzymes <laughs> for magnesium. So, I mean, I'm not going to get into it, but the point is if you're deficient in magnesium, you are going to experience uh, all sorts of symptoms, especially fatigue. In a little bit, wow. I'm going to tell people the five subclinical magnesium deficiencies that are not like what you would think, but they're five symptoms yes. to know if you're slightly deficient in magnesium. Would anyone like to know about that? Anyone? Raise your hand. I've got one person. <laughs> Me. All right. Well, maybe we'll talk about it. Maybe we won't, depending on the interest level. Okay. But um, if no one's interested, we'll just move on to some other interesting okay. topics. Maybe we'll talk about potassium. Okay. I'd like more to hear about both of them. I would, if I okay. get a vote. Okay. Um, good. Any other questions that you have? Angie from Facebook wants to know um, if there's anything you can do about liver and kidney cysts. Um, yeah. I talked about this um, a while ago. Um, the, um, what happens when, you're, when you have cysts on the kidney or the liver, you can, um, it's usually your body's trying to encapsulate something and it's trying to uh, support, uh, like, like prevent some toxins from spreading in the body. But there's some other causes of cysts too, especially if you've heard, you ever hear of like a baker cyst in the back of your knee or a cyst in the body or a cyst in the eye, uh, sty. It could be viral related, but I find it's related to high levels of insulin. Oh, which and is caused by? Sugar, <laughs> carbohydrates. <laughs> so when you actually cut down the carbs, the cysts tend to go bye-bye. Um, it's just mm. like one for one, so it's it's definitely definitely a situation. Good. Any other questions that you have? Um, I have a question about an irritated gallbladder and what to do for that. Yeah, um, the gallbladder is um, on the lower right, underneath the rib cage. It's this. It's there to store the bile, and it helps to. Um, release the bile at a certain quantity to start absorbing all these nutrients. So if you don't have enough bile because the liver is damaged or you don't have a gallbladder, then you get this incomplete digestion of fat-soluble vitamins like vitamin A, D, E, and K. Mm -hmm. But there's certain foods that really irritate the bile, especially the ducts, and that would be like the little tubes around where it comes out. And that's really nuts. That's like the big one. Of course, the, the obvious one would be like taking like, refined carbs and sugar. And also, if, if you eat a, just a ton of fat because you might not have the capacity to digest that and it kind of backs up. Mm -hmm. But mainly for most people, it's the nuts. They're doing too many nuts and it's irritating the gallbladder. So this is why. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is why I always recommend uh, be careful 
of the nuts. Don't go crazy, especially in the beginning. Go, you know, just a small amount. And then also intermittent fasting gives that gallbladder a chance to heal and reset so you're not overloading that thing. But I had a gallbladder problem for probably 12 years before I knew what it was. And it refers pain to the right shoulder blade right through here, up into the neck, the back right here. And you have this like, what is going off my right shoulder? You might feel bloated, burping, be belching, even r into the right head, uh, like the skull, even as headaches. And then you're like, wow, what's, you're thinking that you need to go to the chiropractor, but it's really coming from your gall, but it's referring from a nerve. Mm -hmm. So if one way to know if you have that problem, you just massage the gallbladder underneath your right rib cage mm -hmm. and see if your pain goes away. Because when you step on a dog's tail, he barks through his mouth, right? <laughs> so That's a perfect um, example. It's, it's kind of more of a scien scientific yeah. By the way, Dr. Berg, we should announce that we're now live on Periscope. We have word from the field that is successful. Okay, good. So we got Periscope in the house. That's so right. if you're on Periscope, welcome. And we'll have to figure out how to get questions from Periscope. We will. Maybe and Harry oh, yes. announced our producer. He's listening from Florida on Periscope. He said it's a neat app because you can listen to the audio even if you have the video off. So kind of a radio style I uh, like listening. That. So we'll, we'll inform the uh, viewers and listeners more about Periscope as we go. But right now, if you're a lover of Periscope, go for it. Good. Um, one last thing about the gallbladder. Um, what helps the gallbladder is to take some purified bile salts to help help increase the digestion of fats. But the other thing is just to just get on keto. Maybe be careful of your fats. Don't go too crazy, like too fast. Just gradually going in there, go in there, and then also do intermittent fasting. That should actually help you. There's a great video uh, you can search with Dr. Berg. Search Dr. Berg and then gallbladder flesh. I have a video on how to manually massage the gallbladder to give people relief. It's something that I used a lot, but I mean, when's the last time you ever, ever had your gallbladder worked on, massaged? Never. <laughs> I mean, have you ever been bloated before after eating? Always. Right. So you're going along, feeling bloated, but that everything's just kind of congested. So when people find out how to do that, they're like, oh my gosh, that gave me a yeah. lot of relief because I just kind of took a congested organ and gave it some space and some drainage. But do you have a video on that? Yeah, it's called gallbladder flushing. Okay. It's a simple thing, gives people a lot of relief. and. Um, I mean, I used to do it a lot because uh, I had a gallbladder problem. So anyway, um, let's move on to the next caller, Sanjay from Maryland. Are you there? I'm here, Dr. Bush. Hi. What was your question? Hey, uh, good morning first and good, good morning, morning to Lori. Uh, good morning. Uh, so uh, with your help and uh, with, uh, with your learning from your videos, uh, I have already uh, put my diabetes into remission. But uh, this question is about my lower back pain, which I have for the like, last 30 years. And uh, in one of your videos earlier, I, I found that it could be, it's, it's on the right hand side in the SI joint area. That's where it starts. And it goes to the, uh, used, to, used to go to the right hand, uh, right hand leg, sorry, right leg. And it, um, uh, after starting keto like a year and a half ago, uh, I have resolved it by like 80%, mm -hmm. but it's still there and it increases when I sit, right? And it's more uh, when I'm like uh, lying on the bed for a longer time, like in the morning, it's there and also at night. Okay. So what I did was when I learned that it could be related to ileocecal walls uh, being blocked, so I started massaging it, and as soon as I press on that area or massage it, the pain disappears. Okay. But then it comes back. Okay. So uh, what can you tell me or help me? Uh, here's what uh, I would do if I were you. In the nutrition, yeah, yeah. Go, ahead, go ahead. So here's what I would do. Um, first of all, I would always, love, always, always, you know, if you have back pain of any sort, even if it's the SI joint, sacroiliac joint, uh, vitamin D is what I'm thinking of, and you need at least 20,000 I use to to see some change with the K2. I have tons of videos on that. The other thing is you could, if you wherever the pain is in your back, you can press on the front, do the opposite. So if it's slightly to the right SI joint, you go to the front and you start massaging that. If your problem is in the um, ileocecal valve, then what that usually means is you probably need to um, make sure that you're doing a little bit more hardcore intermittent fasting uh, to allow the transit time to, um, to food to go through uh, so it's not like crammed down there too much. And then other thing is um, 
the purified bile salts will help to lubricate that valve. And it also could be an adrenal issue, uh, which could be helped with the vitamin D, uh, because the adrenal controls the valves. Uh, it's called the sympathetic nervous system. So that's what I would do if I were you. Um, and then one last point I wanted to clarify, because I actually said something that confused uh, a person. Uh, pellagra is actually a B3 deficiency. I might have said B2. But B2, um, you can have just as many skin problems with a B2 deficiency as vitamin B3. So if, you're, if you have this keto rash, you want to make sure you not just have vitamin B2, but you want B3. So you want the whole B vitamin complex for that. So anyway, I uh, got that cleared up. And then we need to talk to Ruth. She's been waiting patiently from Texas. How are you, Ruth? Oh, I'm doing good. good. My pleasure to wait. Thanks. Talk to you for a few minutes. Um, I just wanted to ask you about, uh, well, a little bit about me is I've been on keto for about three years. Went from 250 pounds to 130. Um, wow. I'm 5'4", 51 years old, wow. and... I've called before about uh, hot flashes and other things like that, and all of that seems to have slowly resolved itself. But um, what I've noticed now is I love riding my bike. So I normally ride my bike, oh, I don't know, about 14 miles um, every other day maybe. Mm -hmm. um, but on the occasion that I've ridden it longer, maybe I'm just having a lot of fun or um, I'm enjoying myself. Um, I think 17 and 20 miles is as much as I've gone. But on those occasions, that evening, I get what feels like flu symptoms where my whole body aches and I feel fevered, like okay. I have a low-grade temperature. And I end up having to stay in bed for about three days afterwards, like I'm just wiped out. So I'd like to know why that happens, how can I prevent it, and how can I speed it along to recovery it, when it does happen, if you know, it continues to happen. Because I definitely don't want to leave my bicycle. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. So um, what happens when you exercise and you get sick, or you actually feel like you have the flu, or your immune system is activated. It, it's really just a matter of um, we have to cut back the exercise, unfortunately, because you're not recovering. The exercise is a, is a positive stress, um, but you can overdo it. And if your recovery is low for any reason, and you add too much stress from exercise, it breaks down and stresses out a little too much. It overwhelms the immune system, and that's what you're, what you're running into. So. Um, I know you mentioned this before, and uh, you, you want to cut back, cut back this workout to the point where it's, um, you've got to do it more gradual. Um, for whatever reason, it's taking a lot longer than it should. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, uh, when you get older, um, like I'm 54, and um, people don't recover as fast, do they? <laughs> like, what's up with that? It takes longer to see change with exercise. Have you noticed that? When I turn 50, it's... Like, what's up? That really ticks me off. And it progresses. I'm telling you, like, you, you work out and you're like, wait a second. Uh. <laughs> How come it takes so long to see changes yes. in body tissues? Like, when, I know. when you're 18, you just do one workout and it's like... You're down I'm 10 amazed. pounds. I know, I know. <laughs> it's not fair. So the same thing with your immune system. When you're, um, when you're working out, your recovery might, might need some more help. So you can overdo it and you get sick. The other thing you can do to counter that, um, and you might already be doing this, Ruth, is to take a, a bit more vitamin D3, uh, just because vitamin D3 is very good for the immune system. It's an immune modulator. Uh, so try that, Ruth, and then just cut back the exercise until you can do it. And make sure you do not too many steep hills as, as well. All right, so um, we have a summit coming up. Yes, I was just about to ask you about that. Well, what a coincidence, because <laughs> I actually, I had this little sign asking me for, yeah. Now, the summit is coming up, and um, I'm really excited about it because it's going to be too. at the end of the summer. It's August uh, 31st. We have a lot of people that are watching coming. If you don't know anything about it, go to the website, check it out. We have all these speakers, and um, we have some really cool sponsors coming this, this year. 
We have Keto Mojo. They do all the testing with the, um, the uh, blood testing, and you can measure your ketones and blood sugars. They have a unit that checks both. So they'll be doing that there? They're going to be doing it there, but it's, um, it's very valuable to know like, how deep you're in ketosis and what's going on and mm -hmm. what foods interfere with that. U.S. Wellness Meats are going to be there. They came last year. I pretty much buy a lot of my meats from them. I mean, it's so good. Their butter, their bacon, their beef. It's just like over the top. Uh, yep. Bragg's will be there. You ever have like uh, apple cider vinegar? Bragg's? No. Um, yeah. They, they basically have the apple cider vinegar with the mother. It's like this little sediment. It's really high quality mm -hmm. uh, product. Keto Baking Company. Um, they have these. Uh, it's like a granola. It's pretty good with mm. almond milk. Uh, also, Choco Perfection, which is a really high quality chocolate. Sometimes when you get... This chocolate that's so-called keto-friendly, it gives you gas and bloating. Uh, this one does not. Um, Kabosh Foods is going to be there. They have some interesting new products. I've never um, talked to them personally, but um, they're going to be new. They're going to show up. And also another company called Love Good Fats, which mm. things are shifting. Fats are now good, um, you know. Before they were bad, but now it's, it's, you know, after about, what, 50 years of experimentation, we finally determined that fats are okay for you. Thank goodness. I know. Because I love them. I know. I know. Just leave it up to the government. That's okay. <laughs> um, So anyway, if, if you guys um, haven't come, you should come. It would be great to meet all of you. Yes. Um, but let's go to Derek. Derek's, he's a regular caller from Queens. Derek, how you doing? I'm great, Dr. Berg. Hope you had a great Father's Day. And again, I am looking forward to that keto summit because it is on my birthday, August 31st. So oh my gosh. it doesn't get any better than that. That's awesome. Yeah. So, Dr. Berg, i um, not going to talk about myself today. Um, my mom has been suffering for, for from just severe migraines and you know I like to think of myself as one of your proudest students I know about the whole phrenic nerve and how um, majority of any type of form of headaches is usually a gallbladder issue consisting of the phrenic nerve running along all the way up to the neck and head region but um, I just don't think this is the, the problem with her um, stress definitely ignites her headaches i mean they're they're very painful to the point where you know she can't do anything uh okay. it's like level 20 and then um the other thing i wanted to talk about i have a i have a young girl cousin she suffers from a rare condition it's called em emery dreyfus muscular dystrophy which um which is now affecting her her heart in many ways uh she's starting to get some prolapse symptoms, some um, palpitations, and you name it. So that I have no inclination on. Okay. But, uh, and that's, uh, that's all I got for today. All right. Well, uh, Derek, your, your mom, so severe migraines, of course, I'm assuming she's on keto and intermittent fasting. That usually handles a lot. Uh, she's, and if she is and it's still there, you know, you always check the gallbladder. There's a little nerve that goes up to the head, and it's, if, especially if it's on the right side, if you work on that area, you'll see improvement. But there's a, there's a couple other things you can look at uh, for severe migraines. One is vitamin B2, riboflavin again. Mm -hmm. Keep coming back to that. And taking um, higher amounts, sometimes uh, 10 milligrams per kilogram of weight. So you, you can't really overdo vitamin B2. So that's one thing. The other thing is to check do an evaluation for um, um, certain chemicals in foods, salicylates, uh, lectins in foods that could be causing that. You can do some uh, testing on that. And if that's the cause, you have to change your diet. And all of a sudden, you're going to find that your headaches might go bye-bye. As far as the hand goes, um, I don't have a lot of data on that disorder. But I will, I will say I would probably look into the area of high quality vitamin E for anything related to muscles and nerve problems because vitamin E is essential for that. If you're deficient in vitamin E or you can't absorb it for some reason or even genetic reason, the muscular neural junction will be affected, muscles or nerves or the junction. And so that's what I would do is a high quality vitamin E. Okay? Thanks, Derek. All right. So do we get any answers? Like do people want to know more Magnus. about this five? I'm sorry. 
Magnesium. Yeah. Magnesium, subclinical. Like crazy, they want to know about magnesium. Okay. Yeah. All right. So magnesium deficiencies, um, it's hard to detect them because they're, most of the magnesium is inside the cell. Only 1% is in the blood mm -hmm. and then in the bone. So you get like, where are you going to test it, right? So here are the symptoms. I mean, the number one is stiffness in the morning when you wake up. Okay, so you wake up, you feel stiff. Number two, high blood pressure because the arteries get stiff. Mm -hmm. Everything gets stiff. With Magnesium is kind of like it makes everything kind of soft and elastic and you feel relaxed. Uh, number three is fatigue. Um, your energy called, um, called ATP in the mitochondria, the energy factory, needs magnesium to make energy. So, there, you know, here's what happens. Let's say, for example, you have a certain amount of magnesium that you need, but you don't have all of it. The body will designate based on the priority system. You'll, it'll go for like the quick fixes, like immediate survival, and all the long-term repair and maybe longevity genes uh -huh. won't get the magnesium. Okay. So you probably won't live as long because you're low in magnesium, but you'll be able to get by with some of the you know, essential things like, you know, that, that you might need. Breathing. And yeah, <laughs> breathing and walking. That comes in handy. Right, but you're tired. <laughs> yeah. A you cramp? Got, you're stiff and cramps in your calves. Because if I'm not taking it. Boom. And then the last one is irregular heartbeats. So a heart skips, palpitation, that's magnesium. And so many so, people have, seem to have that now, don't they? Well, that, that brings us to another topic that we'll talk about in a little bit of why people have a magnesium deficiency. Okay? Okay. And uh, we'll cover that in a little bit. But I okay. need to go to David. David, you're from San Jose, California. You are trying to get off Nexium, yes. right? Yeah, um, I'm on Nexium twice a day, yeah. and um, I as prescribed, and flumotazine twice a day. The, the last thing you can said... Can you hear me okay? Yeah, now from, I can hear you. From Motadine? Is that okay, I'm sorry. Okay. You had Nexium, and then the yeah, other one... Yeah, um, basically Pepsid AC okay. uh, twice a day, and Nexium twice a day. Okay. Now, question, Dave. And I, what is the pain when I eat? Is that is that gas? The most pain? likely, because I can't break down my food properly. Yeah. yeah. I'll I'll tell you in a second. Do you do you um? Okay. Have you watched my videos on acid reflux or GERD? Yeah. Okay. Have you tried adding uh, more acid to your stomach yet? Um. Once in a while, I take a milliliter or two of um, uh, apple cider vinegar in water and drink it through a straw. Okay. So let me just kind of give you my, my opinion on this, Dave, and just realize I can't tell you not to take your medication. But these are, these are some topics to research. Um, when you have acid reflux and you're taking Nexium, which are their anti-acid, and um, you're going to lower the acid. and What's going to happen is you need your stomach to be very, very strong as far as the acidity. You need that thing between be between like one and two, maybe three. That's like battery acid. And the stomach there will, will then will have the acid to break down the proteins to stimulate the enzymes to help you break down this protein. So if you don't have the acid, the food doesn't digest. So you're going to get incomplete digestion of protein, and you're going to feel pain in your stomach. And the valve has a sensor that is regulated by the, the pH. So the valve doesn't always close and you get the reflux thing that comes up. And then eventually mm -hmm. you get ulcers and things like that. Um, or which cancer. You yeah. can get cancer. The problem is that if you have an ulcer, then you can't really add more acid in there because it's going to irritate the ulcer. So you have to heal it with something like some chlorophyll, something like that. And then eventually when it's healed, add the, uh, the pH, or the acid. Here's the thing that apple cider vinegar is OK, but you need betaine hydrochloride. Um, and sea salt on a regular basis. Um, but betaine hydrochloride, and you can also do apple cider vinegar pills at the same time, but I would take betaine hydrochloride and apple cider vinegar pills, I would take probably six or seven of those before each meal. I would do keto, I would do intermittent fasting. And I would do that for a period of time because if it's really bad, it could take some weeks to really correct that. But you're going to see by adding the acid in there, that's more of a correction 
because the antacids just keep you going. You feel better temporarily and you keep yeah. needing them. So that is what you're up against. And um, without that acid, you get gas, you get all sorts of issues. Thanks, Dave. All right. Do we have any, am I neglecting any questions? Well, you know, I, I've often wondered about this because of things you hear. Don from Facebook wants to know if there are certain spices that can help you lose weight. And I always, you know how you always hear hot foods? Yeah, like if you, if you eat uh, like, like cayenne pepper, mm -hmm. the heat will then burn off all the extra calories right. and burn off all the fat because it's, it's heat and then we melt the fat, fat right. as in fat burning, right? Makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, no, it's not going to create anything of any significance. What causes the weight gain and the weight loss is mm -hmm. really based on one thing. It's the level of interest in insulin that you have in your body. If the insulin is low, then you can mobilize the fat. And when we talk about burning, um, yeah, we oxidize it, but there's no actual flame going on. It's no actual heat going on, mm -hmm. maybe a tiny bit, but it's it's really just being used as fuel in this machine in the mitochondria. And that machine uh, turns off when you have certain, well, the, what happens is you won't be able to burn fat when you have too much insulin. And insulin comes with carbs. So the carbs basically shut down the ability to burn fat, so you're running mm -hmm. off your sugar, sugar fuel. So how does intermittent fasting play into that? Okay, when what you, about do, that makes when you, you stop eating, uh -huh. um, your body then starts to mobilize your reserve fat. It's finally able to tap into it because oh. the insulin goes down. And not be in that storage mode. Yeah. Okay. So we need to cut carbs and not eat so frequent, and now you can mobilize fat. But the problem is that most people have insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. Now, insulin resistance, what does that mean? It means that your body is trying to protect you against all this insulin. You get too much, so it just starts shutting it down. Right. So now you can't get the fuel in the cell. Now the cell dies, and that's why you get Alzheimer's and dementia. And then also, um, you don't have the absorption of nutrients. So insulin resistance is the catch-22 because you have all this insulin, but it's unavailable to you. And then you start, don't you, is that too, just craving come into yes, that? Yes, craving. You, you're always hungry. You get mm -hmm. snacking. That you eat, but you're not satisfied. You need a little something right. sweet after you eat. Yes. <laughs> so um, what's really cool is if ketones bypass the whole problem. It doesn't, it doesn't need insulin to work. So mm -hmm. you take ketones, you get the fuel right away, insulin resistance can heal, mm -hmm. and now you run your body on an alternative fuel, which actually is way cleaner, way better. You, even the Navy SEALs now are starting to do keto because you, get, you don't generate as much CO2, so you, have, you can hold your breath longer, there's less oh, wow. stress. I mean, if you're new to this this uh, this concept of keto, right. it's going to be it's going to get bigger and bigger with time because it's mm -hmm. very very powerful what it can do. I mean, if it was it's a incredible. fad, it would go away, yeah. but it's growing because it really works. Can you explain what ketones are? Ketones are a alternative fuel, and they're made from your fat. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you burn your fat in the liver, your body makes ketones, and you can run on that as a fuel source. So it's an alternative fuel, but it really it's actually our original fuel that we ran on. Mm. Glucose is just a kind of a recent thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, we it's because think about this. I mean, why does our body store an unlimited amount of fat? An average thin person has over close to ninety to a hundred thousand calories of stored fat on their body. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a hundred thousand, but we only store seventeen hundred um, of of stored sugar. So what does that mean? It means mm. that our bodies were not designed to live off sugar. It was right. designed to live off fat right. and generate ketones. So ketones um, go way beyond just losing um, weight. They actually go on to, they repair your cognitive function. They help you, um, they're like an antioxidant. They actually lower your stress. So mm. yeah. All right, so I need to um, answer a call and then I'm gonna go to another I'm going to talk about this magnesium thing again. Spencer, you're there from California. Do you, you have a question? Yes, actually, I do have a question. Um, about a year ago, I began going through a whole bunch of digestive issues, and my blood pressure went through the roof. Um, so it took me a while to get my blood pressure stabilized, 
and um, I started doing keto, and my digestion has improved a lot. Um, I have candida, and it's been hard. Uh, you know, basically, I have a lot of cravings. I've noticed the apple cider vinegar helps a lot um, with my digestion, and I've been taking the nutritional yeast. But I was wondering if there's anything else you would suggest for me. Good question, Spencer. There's two things. One is that uh, candida cannot live on ketones. Oh. Uh, they, they only Good. lives on sugar. So yeast and candida live on sugar. So the longer you do this and the, and the lower you cut your carbs down, the, the faster it's going to go bye-bye. And that includes also doing intermittent fasting. If you want to speed it up, you can add garlic to your diet in higher amounts and oregano oil, essential oregano oil. I think it's called oregano essential oil. And you take that and actually it'll kill off the candida, but you must cut the carbs way down. Good question. Thanks, Spencer. All right, so now, uh, Lori, mm -hmm. we're going to talk about magnesium, right? Yes. So magnesium is um, a very important mineral. And uh, I'm going to talk about the foods that will, de why we're severely deficient. And this relates to a video I'm going to do today, which basically it's the top sources of calories that the U.S. Um, population lives on. Oh okay. boy. Yeah, these are the calories starting from one all the way down. Okay? Well, it'll be interesting to see which ones are a surprise. Right. I'm, I'm sure you're not going to be too surpri <laughs> surprised. But I would say every single one of these will deplete magnesium because it doesn't have magnesium in there, including potassium. Okay, we got the first one is the grain, grain based desserts. You know, the cakes, the cookies, the oh. donuts, right? Yeah. Those are, that's number one. Drag. Number two, breads. Breads, completely avoid of magnesium. Uh, three, chicken and chicken dishes. And I'm probably not talking, we're talking about probably, uh, not, like not just like regular chicken, you're talking about like Kentucky Fried Chicken or breaded chicken, right. chicken with pasta, that whole thing, the different dishes. Um, number four, soda, energy drinks, and sports drinks. Number five, pizza. Six, alcohol. Seven, pasta pasta dishes, eight, Mexican dishes, uh, nine, beef dishes, uh, 10, dairy desserts, and 11, burgers. We'll talk about fries is with that as well as mm -hmm. the bun. And then number 12 is regular cheese, like Velveeta cheese, processed cheese. And 13 is potato, corn, or other types of chips. Now, isn't this so like <laughs> what we are growing on? No I mean, wonder like, like, <laughs> I have to take magnesium. <laughs> I don't see any magnesium <laughs> on this list or potassium, so we're getting yeah. we're getting. Um, I mean, this is what what I lived on growing oh, up. Oh yeah, I mean, we all did, and uh, and we thought we were doing great. We had no yes. concerns until you know a certain time period, but yeah, I don't see I don't see broccoli on there anywhere. I'm trying mm. to find broccoli. I don't, I don't see kale. I don't see um, avocados. Okay, so what we're getting with this is a massive amount of sodium. Does with avocado have magnesium? Yeah. Oh, good. We don't, we don't have sodium. We have high sodium. We have low minerals. So what's going to happen to these people? Well, they're going to gain weight. They're going to actually have puffiness around the eyes, mm -hmm. especially in the morning. They're going to have a hard time getting out of bed. They're going to be tired all the time. So magnesium comes from greens and um, salads, and we need, we need more potassium and magnesium, minerals. Um, so we're going to have a lot of oxidative damage in our arteries, <coughs> inflammation, and also it's going to create a lot of hunger and craving. Other than that, I think we're going to be fine. And heart, then does that contribute to heart attacks? Because I'm hearing about a lot of heart attacks lately with yeah, heart attacks, people that are getting into their 50s and 60s. You, you have a couple things. You have the mineral deficiencies, which create all the arrhythmias and the atrial fib and mm -hmm. all that. But then you have the heart artery itself that develops plaquing and clot from high levels of insulin because there's damage that provides for any healing, so you get that. And then mm -hmm. you have the heart muscle itself. Um, you have like low vitamin E um, and just high insulin, and then you get a cramp in the heart, and that's a heart attack. Oh, so you can actually have a heart attack just from a cramp from low vitamin E, which comes from refined grains. And then you also can have um, 
an actual clot that kind of goes into the, it could be in the heart, could be in the uh, different vessels in the brain and get a stroke. So the, and that's, that's the high level of insulin. So that's really behind the heart problem. There's like a different mechanisms. That's fascinating uh, it, that your heart would cramp to me. I've never. I mean, never, muscle cramps, it's never right? never occurred to me. A muscle yeah, cramps. Absolutely. It's a heart cramp and you actually get pain in the left arm. And what do they give you? Nitroglycerin mm -hmm. to actually vasodilate muscles. So you can also do adrenaline and that will open up the arteries. But um, mm -hmm. vitamin E acts like nitro in the heart. Vitamin E increases the oxygen carrying capacity by a very large amount. Okay. Let's go to uh, Diane. She's been waiting patiently. You're from California. You had a question about keto and natural B vitamins. Yes, thank you for taking my call, Dr. Berg. Sure. Um, I've been chronically sick for three and a half years, and my health was so bad, I stopped working two and a half years ago, and I found you four months ago, and you have helped me tremendously, so thank you. Oh, great. My, my main symptoms are fatigue, brain fog, severe digestion issues, the bloating with the SIBO, food sensitivities, a hiatal hernia that goes out at night and wakes me up. I've been to 23 healthcare professionals, and a year ago, um, a natural doctor figured out I had chronic Epstein-Barr, and that helped a lot clearing that up, but I still have intermittent chronic fatigue. I've been on T3, T4 for a year, um, just got off of all of it. We're going to retest it because a year ago I had thyroid antibodies test and then I didn't have it. Um, a week ago I found out 10 out of 11 of my neurotransmitters are either too low or too high. My adrenals burned out three years ago. Um, my ferritin recently is very high at 288. My ALT liver went from 56 for almost a year and a half, and I got it down to 38 on keto, so thank you for that. Awesome. And two and a half years, two, yeah, two and a half years ago, I went paleo. Um, through finding you, I've been on um, 50 net carbs uh, starting about five months ago, and then went to 30 net carbs. And three months ago, I got SIBO, and I went to the 10, 15 net carbs. And um, for three months, I've had to grind up my food for every single meal. I've been on a four-day rotational foods diet for two years. I've lost all my crucifer vegetables. I've lost eggs, nuts, chocolate. I've been off sugar and dairy and wheat for two and a half years. Um, so, so I'm going to. I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you a little tip because I have, I have some more callers. But this, this is amazing. This is amazing, Diana. That you're doing much better. But I can see you have a lot of different complexities. I can't necessarily get into a full evaluation on this, this platform because it's uh, we have more calls. But I wanted to um, tell you what I'm going to recommend for this situation because you have a lot going on. But you're doing great. Uh, I think. Um, there's some really, really, really important things, and there's some things that are like, be nice to get into, but right now, I'd focus on the basics. You're bringing your carbs down, okay? That's gonna improve your results. I'm, I think this problem is gonna be, it's gonna get better with time because you've had so many issues in the past. So you're dealing with uh, fixing insulin resistance and then a lot of digestive issues, and then, and then the list goes on from there. So, what I would do is I would start doing healthy keto without the fiber right now. Uh, cut down the fiber until your, your gut heals and then slowly bring it in just very slowly. The two nutrients that are going to be most important are vitamin D3 in higher amounts, taking with the food. Maybe some purified bile salts with that so you can absorb it. And B1. <laughs> That's what you really need. Probably benfotamine in higher amounts because that will help your your cognitive function and your memory so much more than anything else. S but So that's what I would do, but uh, keep watching the videos. Um, sounds like you're doing much better, but yeah, we need to tweak it a little bit. Thanks, Diane. All right, so 
we're going to go to a question that you have. Okay. Uh, Carla from Facebook wants to know, her brother just finished chemotherapy, and he doesn't want to leave keto, but he needs to lose weight because he's, or he needs to gain weight because he's lost all that weight during the chemo. Yeah. And I know a couple of people going through that right now, so I, I think it's probably a question a lot of people might have. The, the thing that you've got to, that's the problem with keto is you lose too much weight. So what you have to do is you have to um, probably do two meals, okay, not mm -hmm. one meal. And then you have to get your calories high. Uh, but not like massive protein, but mm -hmm. a little more fat, right. more vegetables as well. But you're just going to have to eat more of those calories. So Wait, Would you still avoid the sugary things? Absolutely. Yeah. You need to. Okay. You need to. But you could keep your carbs right at 50 grams. Mm -hmm. Maybe 60, but keep your carbs right at the higher level. And that's what you're going to have to do to prevent you from losing more weight. But, the, but doing this with, uh, I mean, think about this. Tumors cannot live on ketones. Right. So... It's the right program to go after, especially to heal the body. Mm. Uh, and then, you know, intermittent fasting is so important for the immune system. So on some people, if they can eat a, a big enough meal, uh, maybe they do spend two hours and just eat this huge, massive meal, mm -hmm. and they just do eat that one time a day. That would be the ideal scene if they can do it. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times their digestive system can't handle that. Okay. Um, I want to talk about one thing. I want to talk about, I'm going to introduce people to a new word. Okay, and the word is uh, hormetic. Have you ever heard of that before? No. Nope. Hormetic. Hormetic is a toxicology word. Well, it's used in toxicology, but it, basically it's a introducing a mild stress, which is a healthy stress, into an organism to create some adaptation to see some positive change. Okay. So let's say like exercise. That's a stress. Okay. But it produces a positive benefit, right? Yes. But if you go too much, you overwhelm the organism. Mm -hmm. So there's many things that are hormetic, okay? Mm -hmm. Like, can you think of any? I mean, other than exercise? Mm. Ketones? Ketones, yeah. Because you're shifting your entire metabolism. Okay. Yeah, so that would be one. How about intermittent fasting? Oh, yes. You're adding a stress, uh, a restrictive <laughs> diet. That's like magic It to really me. is. Be <laughs> because fasting of Fasting is incredible. Be right. Because of this principle of hormetic, like you're... You're, you're actually getting better with the stress. You can't get better without stress. Yeah. I mean, like, doesn't this old saying goes like, uh, uh, if Which it doesn't kill me, yeah. what doesn't kill me makes me I know, stronger. oddly it makes sense, yes. Yeah. Like if you just, if we just put you in a, a petri, uh, like a little chair mm -hmm. and, you, we didn't, and you got rid of all your stress and we just fed you and rolled you around, you would just be miserable. So we need to go through, I think, I think people's yeah. problems is they just don't have enough stress. <laughs> I think we just need maybe, more stress. Maybe it's the type of stresses. True, true. Yeah. Um, but stress does make us stronger. Um, also, you've heard about taking a cold shower in the morning. Yes. That is therapeutic. So you can start it is, telling. Because I hate it. I know it's painful, right? Yeah. So cold and then hot, going a sauna back and forth, it creates this stress that uh, causes your body to adapt. It, you know, after you're done, there is that uh, feeling. Yeah. Exactly. When See? You go in the sauna. So, and then also, um, this might surprise you. Vegetables. Really? Yeah. <laughs> the, f the certain phytonutrients and natural toxins in vegetables mm -hmm. to kill off bugs and things, pesticides. Oh, really? Yeah. That are toxic to and they that to insects um, and yeah. worms and different pests, but they can. They can stress our body if we have too much and if we don't, if we don't have a resistance to them. But um, if you consume vegetables with these so-called toxins, it actually mm -hmm. creates a hormetic effect and it can make you stronger. And that's one of the benefits of vegetables, by the way. Low dose of uh, phytochemicals from vegetables. You would never think that. No, but that's a new one for me, yes. The yeah. marriage must make you very strong, is that right? What's that? Then, then marriage must make you very strong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, going through marriage, that's a hormonic Watch stress. Watch it, Buster. That actually, you know, if you don't go get a divorce, it makes you stronger. <laughs> if you can learn from your mistakes. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's go to, um, it's uh, Benita from Ohio. Are you there, Benita? Yes, I am. 
Hey, what was your question? Well, I've been following you for about a year now. And uh, we started the program for my husband. He is diabetic. Uh, boy, it's working out. It's only been a week, but it's working out fabulously for him. Oh, great. He uh, is, has not taken any of his short-acting insulin, which he takes in the day, and then he takes a long-acting at night. He hasn't taken any during the day since we started this. However, I'm 5'2", about 115 pounds. I am working with a trainer, but I don't have a problem losing weight. And that's just as bad as gaining for me. How can I continue on with the program without losing weight right. but gaining muscle? Right. Of course, the trainer told me the five meals, and I totally identify with what you were saying the other day about how that slows down the day because it definitely does. It's like I can't get through the day. I can't work. By noon, I'm tired. I know. Uh, it's, it's, this is what's taught, uh, but these, the personal trainers are taught, and even the medical profession is taught this idea that you need um, one to 200, well, 200 grams of carbs a day mm -hmm. to prevent muscle loss. Yes. Like, first of all, based on what data, this is like just completely made up uh, information because if you do that, you're going to develop insulin resistance. Now you can't absorb proteins. So you need to fix insulin resistance. You need to probably have the higher end of protein in your diet, okay? And maybe even take a supplement, an amino acid supplement to get the 100% uh, absorption because even when you consume meats, you're only absorbing probably 37% of that for amino acids. But really, it's a combination of things, uh, Benita, to build your muscles. You need good rest, sleep, hormones, growth hormone. Uh, intermittent fasting will stimulate growth hormone. Uh, probably do two meals, but you have to make sure that you're, if you want to prevent the loss of weight, you need to get your calories up. But as far as to gain muscle, there's really, the biggest thing is going to be heavier weights and workouts, exercise. You're going to have to do that to keep the muscle in, uh, growing because you're creating this hormetic effect to make it grow. But as you get older, mm -hmm. it just takes longer. Adding the carbs are just not going to do it. And one last thing, Benita. Um, I'm going to do a video on all the different medications for diabetes, and it's actually quite fascinating to learn about what they do because some of the medications that they do, they create a ketogenic effect. They basically cause your body to burn ketones. That's the, one of the medications. But they never talk about going on a ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. They say, don't do that, but take the medication, it'll put you in keto mm -hmm. ketosis. So uh, that's for another video. That's timely. There are so many people with diabetes. Yeah, I know. Half, more than 60% of the population. Wow. Um, Estella, are you there from California? Yes, I'm here. Hi. Hi. I have a couple of questions. I'm a 28-year-old at 220 pounds. I've been doing keto and intermittent fasting for over a year. And this actually fixed my menstrual cycle, and I'm now pregnant. Wow, that's great. <laughs> so my question is, um, I want to know if it's safe to do keto. I've actually watched some of your videos, but I wanted to see if you can give me any more tips because I don't want to have any complications. Right. Um, mainly, how many? Huh? Right. I don't want to. I don't want to gain weight. Okay. So I want to stay on keto. Right. Uh, how many net carbs? per day? Is magnesium okay during pregnancy? How do I um, he heighten my fiber to help constipation? And um, is halloumi cheese okay? What kind of cheese? Halloumi cheese. I, I don't even know what cheese that is, but, but this is, it's right in this little book right here. That's what you need to do. It, it, I go into the fiber, or I go into the vegetables, but there's some important things that you need to know with this. Do you need to do keto when you're, um, when you're pregnant? 100%. I'm going to tell you why. Now, I probably wouldn't focus on intermittent fasting. Um, I would focus on keto. Why? Because keto is higher in fat. Healthy version of keto, like I talk about in the book, will provide the nutrients as well as cutting down insulin. A great uh, percentage of pregnant women get insulin resistance the last trimester. Mm. And a lot of them t sometimes get mm -hmm. um, gestational diabetes because it mm -hmm. puts more stress on the mother and it's sucking nutrients um, from the mother because it drives it to the baby. 
So if you go into this with some subclinical insulin resistance, you can end up with a pre-diabetic state. So that's why keto is so important because it optimizes the nutrient absorption for that child or that future child. And um, so, yes, do keto. Um, maybe keep your carbs um, at 50 grams, but no more. Make sure you're, it's nutrient dense. One of the most important nutrients to take would be vitamin D if you're pregnant because it's very hard to get that and the child needs vitamin D for the immune system. The other thing is uh, trace minerals. That's the, uh, another thing that's really hard to get. So, and then the B vitamins. That way you can grow this baby with really good teeth, bone structure, um, and be a really robust, healthy baby. Um, if the mother is, gets gestational diabetes, the risk for the child become, becoming a diabetic goes up by three times. So, like, you don't want to go there. You, don't, you no. want to do keto if you're pregnant. Uh, and also breastfeeding. You want to breastfeed as long as possible. I will be doing more videos on this. Um, and I think there was one last question she wanted to know. And I can't remember what it was. But anyway, that should be good for right now. I'll do more videos on that. Hey, Terry, you're from Minnesota. You had a question. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, thank you for taking the call. Sure. Um, I've, been, I've been doing your uh, keto and intermittent fasting. I do one meal a day. I've been doing this now for three months and I just had my follow-up of my A1C two weeks ago and I dropped it from 6.1 to 5.5 and my doc said whatever you're doing keep it up uh, he says <laughs> he says he's never seen anybody drop their blood sugar as quick as I have um, I also tried to order that uh, other blood test that you talked about, uh, OMA. Yeah, OMA, OMA IR. A yeah, OMA okay. IR. Yeah, the blood, um, the lab has never heard anything. I have to go to the uh, hospital to get the blood drawn. <laughs> and they never heard of it before. They says that's probably an outsource. Um, I talked to my doc. He never heard of it before either, so I had it all written down and I gave it to him. He's going to check into it and so forth. And I says I've been following your protocol and stuff, and he says that's fantastic. And he says he's going to look into this. And of course, you know they got to follow their own rules and stuff too. Yeah. So, um, but my <clears throat> question is, I, I notice. Still take my blood sugar test, um, blood tests in the morning and then two hours after meals. But I notice in the morning my blood sugar numbers are slowly creeping upward. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, you know, I'm still I'm just barely under 100 in the morning now. Okay. I did do a four, I did do a 48 hour. Uh, fasting and I dropped it all the way down to 74 I had no side effects or anything like that and stuff I take your products I take trace minerals your B uh, natural uh, yeast um, K was a K2 uh, D3 mm -hmm. um, you know I take it all that stuff and it really helps your electric lights I tried I thought up my potassium electric lights so I had been taking two servings three and it, it never changed my blood sugar numbers at all and I added up all my food and I'm getting approximately almost 4700 milligrams per day perfect let me explain what's going on Terry um, <clears throat> you're on the road to uh, being successful with this things have changed you got some positive things this is a common thing uh, it's called the dawn phenomena. And um, what happens, you wake up and the blood sugars are high. Why? Is it from something you ate the day before? No. Your body is making sugar. It's called gluconeogenesis. Your body is making the sugar from, um, could be from fat or protein that you ate yesterday. That's what's happening. Um, and it's, it's like it's around 100, slightly less. You know, this... Um, 
all this means is you, you're still, um, it's going to take more time. I've had so many people go through this, and then you'll see in the coming months it also starts going down, 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 down until it's like 80 or even 70. So as your liver heals, and I'm talking about fat on your liver and things like that, you're going to find um, your sugar will come down. You could very easily just exercise and burn it off, it's, and it's like not a problem. But all this tells us, Terry, is that you had pretty bad insulin resistance going into this. That's what that means. You probably were pre-diabetic, and it just takes time. Um, so just give it more time, and it eventually clear up. Um, this test, HOMA-IR, you can look it up online, you know, and then you can actually take that link and give it to your doctor so then they can figure out where to get that done not a common thing, and this is the problem. This is why people are not even identifying, because they don't even know what it is. So I'm just bringing your awareness up. But well done. I would just say continue what you're doing, and uh, hopefully you can come out to the summit and learn more about this. There's a lot of people that have amazing results, and so my, my suggestion is if something worked, you want to strengthen that successful action. Coming to the summit is going to give you so mm -hmm. much data on this, so much, like, new viewpoints from different uh, speakers. We have some of the top, I have two cardiologists coming that are keto friendly. So it's gonna be hot. So come to learn um, a lot more, strengthen that, it's work for you. Keep getting more data, keep improving it. Guys, thank you so much for your wonderful questions. We will see you next week, same time, same place.